going to talk about the battle for meaning today, and this is the third of uh, our four times together. And we've talked about the role of the author in the text, and we've talked about the role of the text and reading it carefully, explicating it. And so today we want to talk about uh, our role as readers and interpreters. So on page 13, the third part here is the reader's role and meaning, and we're going to look at the first part of this, and then next class we'll look at the second part of it. We should be in the process of exegeting our culture in addition to the text. As a healthily self-conscious interpreter, we should be aware of many of our cultural biases, personal needs and concerns, present emotional state, etc. All those things have an impact on us when we read the Bible. So today, we're going to be talking about that. And uh, this is really important. This is kind of one of the more uh, somber, but perhaps hopefully insightful times about who we are and how we see the world and uh, what our glasses are like in our culture. You know, we all have glasses that we wear. Cultural glasses, they're welded to our foreheads, aren't they? And you begin to develop these glasses from time you're born and you learn and grow and the interesting thing is we don't even know we're wearing them, do we? Uh, because they're just a part of our worldview, our part of seeing things culturally, our part of interpreting things and we don't even know they're on. Uh, until we see somebody else that has a different set of glasses and uh, they interpret certain things, including the Bible, differently and we say, what's wrong with them? <laughs> Why do they see it that way? This is, don't they understand, this is the way to see it? This is the right way and this is the thing to emphasize? They're seeing things that, that I don't think are even there, you know, and they're emphasizing all the wrong things. These are the things they don't emphasize. These are the things there. And, and of course, uh, things are in the Bible, they're really there, but we want to be aware of the fact that as interpreters we see through these glasses. Now, the, the modern view is we can't get past them. Our glasses, our presuppositions, and all of those things have just locked us in to where we can't get to the text and we certainly can't get to the author's intentions expressed in the text. I don't believe that. I think that's a, a bit too radical and skeptical and it comes from a certain philosophical position that has uh, lots of problems. But I want to learn from the last 40 years of hermeneutics that says we do have glasses. We do have presuppositions. We do have a perspective that affects us. And uh, so what I want to do is uh, unpack particularly the Western set of glasses. And uh, on page uh, 14 you have that. And uh, it's called uh, our uh, Western existential worldview. Now the word existential obviously comes uh, from the word existence. And uh, the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre says, existence precedes essence. In other words, uh, with this, these glasses, I can't necessarily get to the essence of things. I can try to make sense out of it in light of my existence. And that's really about uh, all we can do. That's, that's, that's the best. Making sense of my existence since I can't get to the essence. And this is the uh, emerging view uh, since uh, World War II. And uh, so, uh, what are some characteristics of it? Well, particularly, uh, we see uh, individuals as individuals. <laughs> and identity is an individual thing we'll talk a little bit more about. And life is like a giant smorgasbord. It's like a giant uh, cafeteria that you go through and uh, you can pick whatever you want and put it on your plate. Uh, if you want some go of God, you can pick some of that. If you want something from the Bible, you can pick that. If you want something from family or work, country or pleasure or hobbies or friends, anything, is that as an individual, you go through life and you choose as an individual what you want to put on your plate. And in this view of the world, what is the goal? What are we aiming at? Why are we selecting different things to put on our plate? What do we want out of this? Gratify ourselves. All right, to, to gratify ourselves and 
and particularly, isn't it to be happy and, and fulfilled as an individual? Now, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? People throughout history have, to some degree, wanted to be happy and fulfilled. Nobody says, I want to just have an absolutely miserable, wretched life. Nobody aims at that. But what we have done is uh, we have put uh, to be happy and fulfilled as an individual as kind of the end-all, be-all, haven't we? And that's pretty unique in the history of the world. Uh, and we'll see that, uh, well, if you're from a collectivist culture, a group-oriented culture, your goal isn't primarily to be happy and fulfilled as an individual, is it? What's your goal? Those of you from group-oriented cultures, speak to me. What's your goal? That's right, to, to benefit your group, and specifically, it's to bring honor to your group, isn't it? Your family, uh, your, your uh, uh, ex extended family, your, your village, your, your country, your ethnicity. It's to bring honor to them and to avoid shame, isn't it? To avoid shaming them, but losing honor. And so you live your light in life of that. Now, along the way, do folks in, in group-oriented cultures like this want to be happy? It, yes, but it's subsumed under the greater good of bringing honor and avoiding shame to your group, isn't it? And so you don't obsess necessarily on individual happiness like we do in the West. So this is uh, uh, particularly a more recent view. It's really come into vogue since the 1960s. Philosophically, it's, it's been around for a long time. But uh, this now uh, is uh, really uh, uh, our set of glasses. Now, what's interesting, as I switch glasses here, what's interesting is uh, my dad and mom, who were born in 1920, have a different set of glasses. <laughs> This is, these glasses, are, for those of us in the West, really have been developed uh, since the end of World War II. And so this is a really a generational shift from the World War II uh, generation. My, my parents were born in 1929, or 1920, so they were eight, nine years old when the De Great Depression began. And uh, so that shaped them, and then later on there was World War II, and then the fight with communism and all that. Uh, and, and so I was born in 1948, and uh, you know a lot of that had already passed, and we entered a time of prosperity in this country, and uh, then this worldview came in, and so I have a very different set of glasses from my parents, and my dad's still living, he's gonna be 91, a couple of weeks, and um, I think my dad looks at me sometimes, and he just, he doesn't really understand uh, why I see things so differently from him. And it's because we have very different glasses. Now I look at some of you. Perhaps uh, your parents immigrated from another country. And so they're first generation Americans. And maybe you were a child when you came over, so you're a 1.5 generation, or maybe you were born here. Maybe you're the 2.0. <laughs> and your children are gonna be the 3.0 generation. <laughs> now, is there a big difference between the 1.5 and the first generation? Oh yeah. Is there a big difference between the second generation and the first? Oh yeah, hey, just wait. You haven't seen anything yet. Wait till that third generation, till they become adults. Oh my goodness. What, what's happening? Well, 1.5, the second generation, and certainly the third is developing this set of glasses. Very individualistic. Life is a smorgasbord, and things in life are to be consumed. Consumed to the end that I would have a happy and meaningful life. Wow, let's see. Have we adjusted the gospel and our gospel presentation to this set of glasses? You know, uh, before World War II, the gospel usually began with you are a sinner and separated from God. Well, after World War II, decided, gee, that's kind of a negative way to start, and it is. And so I came up with a, a grand idea, and it's not just one group, but a lot of groups start it this way. And how does it go? God loves you as an individual. See, God loves you as an individual and has, offers a 
wonderful, not a slocky, not a crummy, not a second rate, but a wonderful individual plan for your individual life. See, got the picture? Now, is that, is that a wrong and a bad thing to say? No, it's not. No, it's not. It's, it, it is a, a true thing, but uh, I guess if we step back and say, is that the emphasis of the Bible? Is that the emphasis of the New Testament? No. No, it's not. We'll see what a more accurate thing is. But it is a, a true thing, and God does do that, doesn't He? But we want to be careful that we don't overstate uh, and, and fall into this set of glasses where God is just something, another something to be consumed on the altar of our personal individual happiness and fulfillment. And that's why we need to be aware of our glasses. Okay. Let's look at this and see. Now, uh, what we see, and here's some characteristics. I got to take these glasses off because it's like tripping uh, <laughs> a little bit here, okay? What we see is, uh, we always say that we're radically individualistic. Now, most people, if you ask them who they were throughout history, what would they say? Uh, we see this with Jonah uh, when he gets on the ship with these uh, uh, you know, non-Israelite sailors, uh, and they you know, ask him who he is. What would people say when they say, who are you? What would you say? Son of, Son of such and such. Yeah. James and John, sons of Zebedee. All right. Uh, or the place that you're from. How about this? Jesus of Nazareth. Or Simon of Cyrene, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So it's who your parents are, who your family is, or the place that you're from. It's a group oriented thing. Who do we say we are? Well, we say, I'm an individual. I'm, I'm myself. I am me. There's nobody else like me. And uh, you need to know that's a pretty different view of identity. Again, it's not wrong or bad. It's just reasonably unique on the pages of world history. And, and we need to appreciate that. And uh, those who study this, uh, anthropologists, cultural anthropologists, say there's, uh, there's this view of ourselves as uh, it's called the Western bounded self. And that's what this is a picture of, the Western bounded self. And that is that each individual views uh, his or her identity as its own world, its own universe, <laughs> the Western bounded self. And so we say, hey, what's, Robert, what's happening in your world? We say that, don't we? <laughs> oh man, he's in a totally different universe for me. Well, that's our view of it, isn't it? Now see, that's different, that's pretty unique. And so obviously now, uh, with this set of glasses then, boy, if that were the only characteristic, that would cause you to read the Bible very differently, wouldn't it? Very differently. You're looking for different things as an individual consumer. Uh, it's pervasively relativistic in that, hey, if the goal is for you, to be happy and fulfilled as an individual, then what really can I say to you, Nanette, if, if you know what's gonna make you happy and fulfill you, then uh, I don't have any real authority and I don't necessarily have anything authoritative to say to you, do I? Because you know better than anybody else what's gonna make you happy and what's gonna fulfill you, don't you? And so there's an inherent relativism in this. Hey, if you want God, Great, that's fine, catch. You know, believe in God. Hey, even love Jesus. You could even be a born againer, you know. But hey, that's good for you, but I don't need that. See the relativism? And, and, and if you're going to play on that field, you're going to be in trouble in terms of talking to people about faith in Christ, aren't you? If you're going to step into the totally relativistic thing. Now, additionally, and this is, uh, this is a kicker, uh, we're, we are uh, increasingly narcissistic. And there have been whole books written about the growing narcissism uh, and people being narcissistic in the West and, and, and particularly in America. Uh, what does it mean to be narcissistic? Maybe you're not familiar with that word. <clears throat> Self-centered, self-absorbed. Are babies narcissistic when they're born? Oh yeah, 
everything exists, <laughs> just an extension of, of me and my world, isn't it? Your face, oh, ah, oh, let go. Yeah. See, that's just the part of the, the see? And, and that's okay when you're a, a baby and maybe even when you're one or two years old, but ideally you grow out of it. Now, it's named after a Greek uh, mythology character uh, named Narcissus. And he was the most beautiful of the creatures in the forest. Uh, and uh, a lot of the uh, uh, female creatures were in love with him, but he, he just seemed unapproachable and wouldn't have anything to do with them. And uh, uh, one day he's having a drink out of uh, a, a little pond and he looks at the pond and he sees the most beautiful creature he's ever seen. <laughs> and he uh, uh, is falls in love with that creature and, and he gets cursed by a, a, a passing person that he has not been interested in, that he jilted them and so they kind of curse him. And so he longs to, uh, to know that person and to have a relationship and to love them. And of course what he's fallen in love with is his own image. And finally he wastes the way there uh, for the love of himself and, and wanting this you know, relationship with himself. And that's where this whole thing of narcissism. Now, is it wrong to love yourself? Of course not. Uh, but but there's, a, there's a healthy balance here, isn't there, uh, in this. And, and so uh, folks have, have noted that here we are, those of us born since World War II in this country, we have a very individualistic view. We have a narcissistic view that uh, all the things of life exist so that I may consume them in some, if I want to, if I choose to, and put them on my plate of personal fulfillment. And uh, so then I have a certain individual fulfillment strategy, don't I? Now, uh, how does that work with families? Well, mom and dad, each with their own individual personal fulfillment strategy, and maybe there's three kids, each of them with their own individual personal fulfillment strategy. And so here's five people bundled together and we call it a family. Do you think those personal fulfillment strategies might compete with one another or conflict with one another at certain times? Oh yeah, oh yeah, they sure do. And then we have problems, don't we? Because if I do what you want to do, that may fulfill you, but it won't fulfill me. Oh, wow, but well, that's only five people. What happens when you get 200 people together and you call it a church? <laughs> and here's 200 people, assuming if they're all born, if they're younger, 200 people born since World War II with this set of glasses, with this view of the world, and each one with their own personal individual fulfillment strategy <laughs> to be happy and fulfilled. Wow, how's church going to work? Is that, going to be a, is that going to be a fun experience? Whew. No. No. You see, our view of church is we're a bundle of individuals loosely tied together. Loosely. Think of a bundle of sticks loosely tied together. And if I don't like this bundle, I'm going to just take my stick and go to another bundle and down the street and join that bundle <laughs> and see how that works. You got the picture? The, the picture of the New Testament, of course, is the church is not of a bundle of sticks, but think of the cross section of a tree where we are organically connected to one another. We are attached to one another. We are an organism, not a bundle. That's a big difference, isn't it? Yeah, and that, it's great. Different ministries, different emphases, you know, different sorts of things. And, and, and what's interesting, see, the older generation, the World War II generation, doesn't necessarily think that way. They have a lot more commitment to the church as an institution, don't they? And, uh, for example, they have a lot more commitment to supporting the general budget, the general fund of the church, don't they? While those of us who are younger than that, that's funny, I'm 63 to call myself younger. Okay, won't be able to do that much longer. Um, but those of us who are younger, we like to have more targeted focus giving, don't we? We want to give to the things we want to give to. We don't want to just give to the general church fund and this thing, the general budget. 
we have specific interests because we're interested in those and those will be more fulfilling if we give to those. See, that's, so that's a, you're right, it's a very uh, different sort of a perspective. Now, the next thing, this idea of being excruciatingly empty. Wow, this is another, uh, another uh, painful thing. Uh, those who study uh, Western culture say, in addition to having this th identity of the Western bounded self, there's also corresponding to that is the empty self. And that is, there is an inherent loneliness that we feel there's a disconnection from other people and, and, and uh, our family and the culture, whatever. There is a sense of purposelessness. There is a um, sense of um, a depression, a lot of free-floating anxiety. Uh, I have a footnote uh, when I talk about this, and I don't remember exactly what chapter I talk about it in Playing With Fire, but there's a footnote, and it's an incredible article. You ought to get a copy of that at the library and read it called The Empty Self by Philip Cushman. And it's one of the best exposés of what's going on emotionally. Uh, if you watch any TV, uh, you'll notice that there are a lot of antidepressants that are advertised on TV now. Isn't that amazing? And, and you talk to people and they can just list off uh, the, the number of, uh, all, you know, four or five different antidepressants and they may have been on all of them at one time or another. Now, I'm speaking as an insider to this because I have an empty self. Uh, how does that happen? Well, let me give an example. My grandparents lived basically in the same small town for their whole life. A little town in the Midwest part of the United States in southern Missouri, a little town called Bolivar, Missouri. And there are, at the cemetery, there's about six or seven generations of our family buried there. So, they lived there for 90 years. At their funerals, people said, came up to me and said, I've known your grandfather or your grandmother for 85 years. Wow, I, I couldn't even relate to that. The same place, rootedness, shared meaning values, shared traditions, and the result is they didn't have an empty self <laughs> because they had rootedness and connectedness and identity. Now, how about two generations later, their grandson? Well, I left that small town. We moved to Kansas City, the big city, uh, with the bad sports teams, and uh, especially in football this season. Uh, we have no luck. I don't know. We could have some luck. Andrew Luck, the first draft choice, a quarterback, you know, next year. That could be our luck. Uh, okay, side note. All right. Um, I'm, I moved, so now I was already in a second town and I finished going up there. Then I went to, college, went away to college and lived in Columbia, Missouri, another place. And then when I graduated, I moved to the East Coast uh, to work at USC, University of South Carolina, in Columbia, South Carolina. I lived there one year. And then I moved and, and was a campus director with Campus Crusade for Christ at Oxford, Mississippi. And I lived there for three years, got married there. And so then my wife and I moved to Dallas, uh, Texas to go to, to seminary for four years. And then we, we uprooted and then we went to Arlington, Texas for two years. And then we went to Baltimore for seven years. And then we uh, went uh, to uh, Lynchburg, Virginia for three years, and then we moved out here. You got the picture? I've lived all the country, <laughs> coast to coast. Do I have a sense of connectedness with people and, uh, and uh, ongoing relationships? Well, you know when you move away, if you've ever done that, it's hard to maintain relationships, isn't it? It's really hard. And especially if you've got five or six or seven different places that you've lived. So you see, I have an empty self. I know what that's like. I've struggled with loneliness my whole life. I've struggled with depression. I mentioned this the other night, uh, speaking in a church, and I had uh, uh, two people come up to me uh, and, and said, I've struggled with depression too. And so we just kind of compared notes and we were on three different antidepressants. <laughs> but we knew about each other's and all of that. So, so I'm an insider when I talk about this. I, I'm, I don't, I'm not judgmental. I, I've lived this and, and, and I know this. And that's one of the things my dad doesn't understand. Now, why are you depressed? 
uh, you know, your life, he does, he's not this crass, but he says, your life, Walt, uh, he could say, is, is infinitely easier than my life has been, and it's incredibly uh, easier than your grandparents' life was. You know, they struggled, they had a ninth grade education, they, they worked hard and clawed out a, a living, kind of hand to mouth. Uh, you, Walt, he could say this, he wouldn't, you, Walt, are educated far beyond your intelligence. <laughs> you have a college degree, you have a THM degree, you have an MA in theology, then you have a PhD. You know, you spent 13 years in graduate school. You're educated far beyond your native intelligence. And you're right, you're right. Now my dad would never say that, but he has a right to. And, and you have a great job, you have a wonderful wife and great kids, and uh, you're influencing people, you're teaching. Now, why in heaven's name are you depressed? And that's a good point, isn't it? It's a good question. Well, dad, it's because I have an empty self. You don't have one, and so you don't know what that's like but I do, and we do. So, those of us then who have an empty self, when it comes time to worship, then um, that impacts how we want to worship. Now let me, before we talk about that, let me talk about the fact we're also ahistorical. That is, we don't have a sense of being a part of history, but our relationship with Christ increasingly for us is uh, Jesus and me in our little existential bubble kind of floating through space and, you know, not, not necessarily being rooted and grounded in history and have a, a purpose in history and a part of what God is doing in the world is kind of more disconnected. It's without a sense of history. It's ahistorical. It's just, we're, we're kind of just in the moment. It's self-authorizing. We've already talked about that in terms of uh, what's good for my life uh, may not be good for your life, and you can't tell me about this. Uh, it's my life, and I'm the one that authorizes what I do and all that. And ultimately, it's kind of a secularized view, isn't it? God exists, and He's like a yo-yo. He's on the end of my string, and He exists uh, largely uh, to help satisfy me, to fill this emptiness, and, uh, and, and I, I love Him, and I serve Him, but, wow, it leads to a rather truncated or, or shrunken view of who God is. So what happens with this set of glasses when it, we come time to worship? Well, what kind of songs do we like? The great hymns of the faith that talk about God in three persons? Oh, no. We like choruses like this. All right. If one of your friends wrote this, my apologies to you and your friend. Actually, I was speaking in a church a couple of years ago and, and got through this. The pastor said, yeah, one of my uh, good friends wrote this. I, I didn't know what to say. Other than I wanted to say, you know, a little theology would really be helpful to that person, but I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> All right. Now, there are nine sentences in this chorus. I want you to tell me the subject of each sentence. Hungry, I come to you, for I know you satisfy. What's the subject? Uh, I. First person, singular. Second sentence, I am empty, but I know your love does not run dry. Subject? Uh, I. First person, singular. And so, I wait for you. I. It's getting repetitious, isn't it? And so, I wait for you. I'm, I am, falling on my knees. I'm offering all of me. There's two of them. I, first sentence, and understood I in the second one. I'm offering all of me, not somebody else. I'm doing that. Jesus, you're all this heart is living for. Wow, okay. We broke our string of singing about ourselves. Now we're going to tip our hat to Jesus. Oh, but enough of that. Broken. <laughs> I run to you, for your arms are open wide. I am weary, but I know your touch restores my life. Do the math. That's eight out of nine, folks. Eight out of nine. What are we singing about? Our emptiness. 
I'm not against singing about that. There, there is a place for that. But I am against singing songs like this 80, 90, 95% of the time. Number one, that's pretty narcissistic, isn't it? Singing about ourselves. And number two, just singing about ourselves and our emptiness, will that fill up the emptiness? Will that get us where we want to be? Will that help us to know the living God in three persons and uh, the love of God, the, the person and the work of Christ and the, the wonderful fellowship in the Holy Spirit? If we're, if we're so focused on ourselves, will, will that get us where we want to be? So just for pragmatic reasons, it's not a good way to go to sing this sort of stuff the vast majority of the time. Uh, there's, there's a need uh, for balance in this. And if you study the Psalms, you would find that certainly they talk about uh, the individual experience, but they really balance it out with a God focus, don't they? And so it's, it's a both and. And uh, so uh, the, any of you, maybe you don't want to identify now, any of you involved in uh, leading worship or playing worship music in this? Okay. Uh, any feedback you'd have for me about this? Am I overstating it? Okay, but there are some good songs emerging that are more God, Christ, and Holy Spirit centered, aren't there? Aren't there some like in Christ alone? Wow, that's a great one. And there's good theology in those kinds of songs. Now, interestingly enough, in my humble opinion, the best of them are coming from uh, those outside the United States. Uh, a lot of those in Christ Alone, uh, it, it's a British uh, songwriter. And there's a wonderful school of British evangelicals that are creating new hymns. Uh, and, and here's the important thing, those of you interested in music and the arts. The younger generation will listen and learn and this is a sad thing to say, probably more from the songs they sing than the sermons that they hear, because they don't like to listen to sermons particularly. How about that? It's not, it's, am I overstating that? No, it's, no. So let's give them some incredible music. Let's give them some incredible theology. And if we don't know enough to, uh, you know, be able to put that kind of theology in our songs, then let's take, as we are beginning to do, some of the incredible hymns and put a contemporary uh, uh, melody to it. And, and we're beginning to do that with, uh, uh, what are some of them? Uh, help me out. I know uh, even uh, Amazing Grace, that's, I heard that this past with a little different uh, uh, syncopation to it. What are some others? Take my life and let it be, okay. Before the throne of God. Before the throne of God, okay. Ah, oh, this is great, see, because I, I sing some of these great hymns, especially written by uh, John and Charles Wesley, and uh, I'm, a, I'm, a stu I'm stunned at the thoughtful, penetrating theology in those. It's beautiful. It, 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 it's incredible. and. Uh, and think of the people that were singing that, and then you go away uh, from the gathering, you're singing it, and uh, you think about it all week, and it comes to mind, and, and you think through it, and you absorb and ponder and take that theology deep into your soul, don't you? Let me just say, there's not a lot of theology to take in your soul with this kind of music. It's, there's a place for it, singing about our pain and our emptiness, but I guess I would say, I have two main criticisms. Uh, number one, it's picturing worship as primarily an individual thing. Now, it is when you're by yourself. Sing this all you want when you're by yourself. But when we're together, when we're together, it's time for we, our, and us, not I, me, my. This is our time together. You're not alone, so don't just sing songs that reinforce your individual aloneness. <laughs> because what you're doing then, worship then, is just a bundle of individuals all in their little individual worship bubbles singing I, me, my. That just reinforces the empty self, the loneliness. 
It won't get us where we want to be, where we need to be. Let's use this. Okay, we can sing one or two of these, but let's sing songs that talk about uh, we and, and us and our heritage together as a people of God. So that as you sing, you can look around and say, wow, these are my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the family of God. I'm not alone. Now, okay, we need to work on our relationships a lot more than we do in a lot of churches. But worship is a time for us. And, uh, and that's why uh, older folks in our churches, <laughs> they, they hate these kind of songs. Now, they don't have an empty self, so it's not particularly relevant. But they also hate it, and it's a second point, because it's not God-centered enough. It's, it's me, and I, me, mine, self-centered, isn't it? Okay, so that's why we have the worship wars and have had for some time. It's, it's, it's really, it's a battle of glasses, isn't it? Worldviews. And so, again, there's need for balance uh, and, and there's need to understand where we're coming from and uh, just to, to have a little healthier uh, perspective and, uh, and to be careful that in our contextualizing of the gospel, for our culture, for these glasses, that uh, you need to know that the way we package it uh, wouldn't necessarily appeal to uh, Christians in other culture today or in, uh, to Christians uh, in, earlier in other times of the church. <laughs> <laughs> You see how very American it is? And so we take our understanding of, of the gospel that our glasses give, give us and we retroject that into the Bible. And uh, Jesus said something that clashes a bit with this. For whoever wishes to save his or her life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels shall save it. Now that's irony, isn't it? That is drenched with irony. If your goal in life is to find your life, you're never going to find it. <laughs> it's going to be the elusive butterfly that you never catch. And that's the, that's the tragic irony of, of a whole culture that gives itself to trying to find its life in an individual sense. It, it, it will never happen and, and there will be eternal consequences. And so the irony is, if you want to find your life, and of course we all do want to find our life, don't we? Then we have to lose it. We have to, to give it up. Not in meaningless religious activity, but in following Jesus Christ. Knowing Him personally. God, the Father, Jesus, His Son, and the indwelling Holy Spirit. And in strategically and meaningfully losing our life in the cause of Jesus Christ. Irony of ironies, you will find it. Isn't that incredible? And that's really the Christian life. And this then, on the bottom of page, uh, well, before we get into that, bottom of page 14, we'll talk about it. Uh, questions about this? Uh, yeah, I just had Chris. a comment, but um, you don't have to do that. And remember no. No, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not mean-spirited, there's no uh, uh, sinful intentionality behind it. Uh, but, uh, I guess maybe I'd say it, it might just be unexamined glasses, uh, to some degree, culturally, on this. That's all. Just unexamined glasses. But no, I think, again, I don't think it's wrong to sing these. Uh, I'm just arguing for balance, just, just for balance. Uh, and again, if this is all we sing in our church and we have folks that are, you know, 65 years old and up, you, you need to know that most of them aren't connecting with this. They just, they have different glasses. So, so it's, it's, not, it's not very sensitive to the whole community of the church, I guess. It kind of disenfranchises a whole lot of folks. And, and a lot of churches that go this route and are appealing to younger basically say to the older folks who, who built the community and invested in it and whatever, uh, go somewhere else. <laughs> wow, that's not, that's not a very good view of the body of Christ either, is it? So, yeah. 
Right. No, I, I, of course, there's a sense of it that transcends all cultures. Uh, it's just in the West, we've done certain things that underscore and that emptiness. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, I think of China and just some recent things I've read, as there's growing prosperity in China uh, and uh, uh, the, the one child limitation that the government put on families, it's gonna be, it is interesting to see the phenomenon that, that there will be m more characteristics similar to kind of, uh, you know, the, the Western existential view with that. Uh, you know, if you're the only child and uh, on, uh, you know, a grandchild on your mother's side and your father's side and it's two, these two family lines focus on this one child, then, uh, and then that child goes into a school with a lot of other, you know, uh, single <laughs> uh, children. Uh, and wow, what's that gonna look like in terms of a community and society and sharing and working together and all that if you've had all these people focusing on you, you're their hopes and dreams and all that. So, yeah, but no, you're right. There is a, there's an innate hunger for God. Uh, I just, I think in addition to that though, we've created uh, a cultural aloneness in, that, that a adds to that pain. And I know you can feel alone in a group-oriented culture too. And, and I think probably people are sensing that more and more. Also, uh, you know, throughout history, people, uh, mo many of them were at a subsistence level. <laughs> and you didn't have a lot of time and energy to think about, uh, you know, what they were feeling, kind of what was going on, because it was simply trying to survive, to have food, shelter, and clothing. And uh, that, uh, you know, doing that was enough in and of itself. Now, I think we should be a little more self-reflective than that, but um, to have, be in a culture now where we have affluence and we can do this, um, and have more self-reflection is kind of a part of, of that, of our modern culture. Okay, at least some of it. All right, here's the bottom of page 14. Here's what I think we should be moving people toward this. I think it's more of a, of a Christian, a biblical, a historical view of the world. It's a different set of glasses. And I do think the Bible talks about plans, but it's primarily God has a plan. <laughs> that he is working out in human history through his people, Israel in the Old Testament, the church today, as a good premillennialist, uh, restored Israel in the future. God has a plan. And that's the emphasis of the Old and New Testament. Now, are there individual facets of that plan for each of us? Yes, of course there is. And, and that's a wonderful part of God's kindness and love. Is the individual plan the focal point of the Bible that each of us has? No, that's not the focal point, but it's a part of it. So again, it's just, it's just balance. Let's look at the individual plan uh, as it is uh, encompassed by the plan that God has. And what is his plan? Well, it's to bless all the peoples, people groups of the world. Jump ahead to the end of the story in Revelation. What do you have? People of every tribe, tongue, and nation standing before the throne and praising God. And God has decided that that's what uh, creation was about. The fall thwarted that. But the seed of Abraham, ultimately culminating in Jesus Christ, uh, is uh, the, the remedy to that. Uh, the, the second Adam, Jesus, is greater than the first Adam. And so he will bring this about. Why did God choose this as a plan for human history? Well, the one thing I can definitively say is because we would assume it brings the greatest glory to him. If that were not the case, then it would be unjust and inappropriate, <laughs> and he would have chose something else. So it brings the greatest glory to him. And so we, we submit to that. We, uh, we subsume ourselves now in the Church of Jesus Christ to be a meaningful part of that plan. We've, we find our role on the team. How? Well, through discovering our spiritual gifts, don't we? And we find out those things the Spirit has 
uh, implanted in us uh, at our uh, baptism in, uh, in the Spirit, when we believed in Jesus Christ and the Spirit baptized us, uh, that He gave gifts as He chose, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, He the Spirit chose. So they come from the Father, they come uh, uh, the gifts of Jesus Christ, Christ acquired for us, uh, and they are mediated to us through the, the Holy Spirit. So it's a Trinitarian thing involved. And so he, all of us has a place, every one of us has a place on the team in, in the Church of Jesus Christ, an organic role to fulfill. And as we discover that and move into that, then <laughs> Surprise of surprises, we find happiness and fulfillment, don't we? Not because we're seeking happiness and fulfillment, but we're seeking to obey and, and to serve Jesus Christ in the roles that He has chosen for us, by and large. Now, there's freedom in that, but through our gifting, He's crafted boundaries kind of to the things that we ought to be doing, hasn't He? And so our responsibility as a body of Christ is to help each other find that. And oh, by the way, if you're going to be a leader in the Church of Jesus Christ, your responsibility is to create an environment that's conducive to God's people finding out who they are in terms of their spiritual gifts and, yea, equipping them to do the work of ministry. How about that? Is that what we're doing here? Is that what we're doing in school? I don't think we're doing that, are we? We don't talk about that very much, do we? We don't emphasize that, and that's a problem. But see, this is now a massive educational task, isn't it? To move people from this set of glasses, in this culture, or whatever culture you're in, to a more biblical set of glasses, a historical set of glasses, to, to find out and be a part of what God is doing in the world. And that's a massive educational task, isn't it? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, I agree a lot with what John says. Not everything, but a lot. Okay, and I think basically I agree with his construct. There are some things that I'd part company with him um, as, as we walk down the Calvinistic trail together, then I kind of veer off a little bit before John does. He keeps going all the way to the end, so. That's just because, you know, you're talking about glorifying God. Yes. And yeah, his, his yeah, voice. that's a part of his. Uh, but there's some elements to it that, that uh, are a bit troubling to me in terms of how he deals with that. So that's all I want to say about that. I don't want to get into. Uh, the, in the pictures, the, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? The restored Israel. Restored Israel. Is that the meaning of the physically restored Israel? Israel or yes. Yes. This is uh, the, the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel in the Old Testament to regather and restore her uh, under Messiah Jesus. And uh, yeah, that's why we, it's a pre-millennial understanding as opposed to an all-millennial understanding or a post-millennial understanding. So you'll learn that in your other classes, but I just want to lay that out before you and jangle your theological system a little bit, okay? <laughs> so you'll, you'll learn more about that. Okay, now. Uh, this is why we really need to teach folks the Bible, because the Bible becomes the main thing to help people move from their glasses, if they're like these, the Western existential, or whatever they're like, to a, more of a, a biblical uh, Christian historical understanding of what God's doing in the world. And that's quite a task, isn't it? That's quite a task. And you just can't leave people with their glasses. Just come in, and you certainly don't want to just put a thin Christian veneer over these glasses. Or whatever cultural glasses people walk into your church and become a part of people of God. It's not loving to them to leave their glasses on and have them continue to see the Bible through that. Uh, there's, there's distortion in that, isn't there? And uh, so let's talk about that distortion. What kind of questions arise here with Western existential glasses? What kind of interpretive questions you ask of the Bible? I'm still on page 14. What kind of questions do you ask? You read the Bible, you open it up, and you say, What does it mean to me? First of all, we make meaning an individual personal thing. Yeah, what does it mean to me? And what, and what was the second one? Yeah, how does it relate to me? 
Our favorite interpretive question is, what does this passage tell me about me? <laughs> That's our favorite. We kind of reduce everything uh, to meism. It's about me. Uh, what does this tell me about how to be happy, to be successful? At Americans, we're very pragmatic. We love these success things. You see the sermon topics. I get flyers in the mail, or you drive by a church building and there's a sign there. We're starting uh, a five-week series on how to be successful in the workplace. Wow, okay. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is it's from Joshua. Wow, how to be successful in the workplace. Uh, is that killing all of the folks who don't agree with you? Uh, how does that work in Joshua? I'm not sure how that... Okay. Uh, but see, it, these glasses generate a, a whole set of questions. Uh, again, they're heartfelt questions, but, but some of them are alien. They're, they're, they're the wrong questions to ask, aren't they? And it just reinforces our, our, our self-centeredness. And, and the Bible and God are just part of, they're on my string, and I yo-yo them up and down, and they exist uh, to serve me and help me. And, and we've got to invert that, don't we? In, in, a, in a healthy, vibrant way. So, okay, if you have a uh, Christian, a bit, uh, historical worldview, what kind of questions are you going to ask? As you begin the transition for, away from these glasses, what kind of questions? What is, God what is God doing in the world? What does the Bible say about this? If God has a plan, what is He doing? Yeah, how does he reveal himself? What do we learn about him in this passage? What is God like? I'm always going to be the dissenting voice. Okay, can you wait till we unpack this a little bit more? Then you can okay. dissent, okay. Uh, what are the kind of questions? When, as I see this plan, uh, how do I fit into what God is doing in the world? That's a legitimate question, isn't it? Of course. Uh, a lot of the Bible is about God, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Uh, a lot of the Gospels are about Jesus. Um, and lots of things about, you know, the Holy Spirit, too. And, and so things about God or His Old Testament people or about Jesus and, and uh, uh, the people around Him and the book of Acts and Epistles and Revelation, all of these things are incredibly relevant and significant to us, but they're not all directly about us, are they? They're relevant to us. We need to know who God is to know who we are. How can we know who we are unless we know who God is if we're made in His image? We are uh, uh, theomorphic in, in the image of God, aren't we? Uh, rather than God being anthropomorphic and being in our image, we are in His image. We need to know who He is. We need to know who Jesus is. If we're to be His disciples and to follow Him, and if we're being conformed to His image, we need to know who He is, what His values, how that functions, and all that. So, yeah, it, 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 it should spawn, uh, you know, better questions. How can I join what God is doing in the world? Again, they're not impersonal and unrelated to our lives, but they come in at a different way than we're used to uh, and, and cause us to uh, change our view of the world a bit. Yeah. They are. I totally agree. I guess a better question would be, uh, rather than assuming it's about me and, and pulling it through that keyhole, uh, we should figure out uh, who it's about, what it's about, and then ask, what is the relevance or significance of that to me? So it could be about anything, and yet if it's in the Bible, it has relevance and significance to me. I think that's a better way. Is that, is that fair? That's a better way to go. So it, we're not depersonalizing the Bible. We're not pushing it away. Oh, far from it. We're trying to understand it as it is, and then to bring it uh, very deeply and intimately into our lives. But we don't want to distort the message of it and in, in bring it into our lives. That, that's, that's a lose-lose, isn't it? It's a word, if you will, from the outside of us. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to remake the Bible in my own image. I want to hear what God has to say. 
and then he will remake me in, in, in the image of his son. You know, that's the way it works, isn't it? So I, I, I don't want us, and we, we have done this to some degree, domesticate the Bible, <laughs> tame the Bible, make it mirror, the mirror image of our culture. I don't, that's, that's not edifying, is it? That, that's, that, that's not glorifying to God. So that's, I need that word from the outside. I don't know about you. I'm tired of hearing my own voice in my own head. I just hear one. I don't hear multiple voices. Okay, just to, so you don't worry about me. Just it's my, my voice. Okay, now, how about John 15? Familiar passage. How uh, do our glasses impact our reading of John 15, 1 through 8? Okay, let's talk a little bit about the setting of this passage. What's the setting? Uh, always in the Gospels you ask two questions. What the se what's the setting in Jesus' life and ministry? That's the first one. And then the second one is, what's the setting? And of course these are related in John's uh, argument in, in the flow of the book. So what's, where are we in Jesus' life and ministry? In John 15, verses 1 through 8. All right, the Passover meal, when? Okay, which Passover? There's uh, uh, at least three Passovers in John's Gospel. This is his uh, last one, right? <laughs> his last Passover, okay. All right, uh, all right. So uh, specifically then, we're in Passion Week. Okay, and uh, this is Jesus' last meal with his disciples before his arrest. And uh, it begins in, well, where does this whole section begin in John's Gospel? Chapter 13, yeah, it runs up through chapter 17. It's called the Upper Room Discourse, for want of a better title, okay? Uh, although some of it is outside of the Upper Room, probably. Um, all right, so it's uh, 13 through 17, um, five different chapters on the, the night that Jesus is going to be arrested. Now, what is just the setting of that? What does that lend to this passage then? Last time, Last time it's, it's, it's powerful. There's intense emotions floating around, at least in Jesus' soul, aren't there? Yeah. Now, the disciples, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly how plugged in they are to know what's going on. But uh, within, uh, you know, two or three hours, when Jesus gets arrested, they're going to know what's going on, aren't they? Okay, so this is a really intense, difficult time uh, emotionally. It's, and, and these are, in a sense, in, 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 in John's recording, of these are Jesus' last words to them before his uh, arrest, his suffering, his death, his burial and his resurrection. Now there'll be further words after his resurrection, but these are all in, in preparation for the upcoming events, aren't they? Okay, so anything else contextually about this? It's unique to John's Gospel, this section, 13 through 17, chapters, the Upper Room Discourse. Right, he's filling in a, a, an amazing gap and it's wonderful that he does this. This is great stuff that we know this and see our Savior's heart and, and insight into these events. Okay, now, in terms of this particular section, John 15, one through eight, why does Jesus say this to his disciples at this time? Why do you think he's saying this? And it's an allegory, isn't it, that he's creating? He's creating an allegory, and he tells uh, who uh, the, the correspondences, aren't they? I, Jesus, am the vine, you are the branches, and my Father is the vine dresser. So it's an allegory he creates. All right, not a lot of these in uh, the Gospels, but this is, this is one of the beautiful, important ones, isn't it? Okay, so what's his purpose? Why is he telling them, creating this allegory and, and teaching them to them? At this point, Okay. Nanette and I had a discussion about this last night at her church. So, 
I okay, wasn't Nadine. going to reveal any of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. You wait and see if anybody. Okay. Why teach? Why say this to them at this time? Any sense of that? Yeah. Maybe um, because now they're going to be kind of on their own to really sort of, I guess, think for themselves in, in a sense. All right. Yeah. It's kind of think for themselves. Good. Kind of incumbent on them to. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Nanette, you were going to say something. <laughs> I was going to give my own conclusions. <laughs> oh, don't give me your conclusions yet. Why is Jesus saying this now? What do you oh. think? Um, because I think they're about to face something way more frightening and chaotic than anything before, and they don't realize it yet. Right. But he's not going to be physically present with them. Right. He's preparing them. This is a loving preparation for them, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody else had. Yeah. It's pretty much the same thing, but I just noticed that he promises them the spirit, and then he says, uh, the ruler of the world is coming. So he's kind of like warning them, and then he's yeah. telling them to abide, and then the world's going to hate you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good. So he already told them that he's leaving. Right. So he said, I'm leaving. Yeah. Yet, then, this, yeah. then he prepares them with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right. Makes sense in the context of okay, if you're leaving, how do we abide? Right. Exactly. Right. And and especially John chapter 14, 15, and 16, some of the most wonderful teaching about the Holy Spirit in in the New Testament, particularly the word paraclete, parakletos in Greek, is a, a, a comforter, one called alongside, uh, used uh, in, in legal settings, or maybe a family member who comes. Away, if you're going to court and, and they intercede for you and they are an advocate for you in that. So a wonderful, beautiful uh, picture of, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So good, good stuff. You're absolutely right. Now, does Jesus say, I am the vine? Is that what he first says? True, true vine. Oh, I am the true vine. Why stick that little adjective, the true vine? Why not just say, I'm the vine, you're the branches, my father's a vine dresser. Why not, why say, I am the true vine? There is false vine. Pardon? There is not true vine. There is a false vine. Yeah, that's what is implied, isn't it? There's a false vine, and I'm the true vine. It's kind of low. Is, is this passage is related to the uh, argumentation, law and faith. Okay. So All right. Just, okay, just, good. It's related to the... Emphasis on that? Yeah. Dolly. Wow. Good. That's great. Uh, is this talked about a couple times in the Old Testament? This Israel is the vine? In uh, Isaiah and in Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of times. Uh, it's interesting the colors. Uh, it says true vine. That's what the bank, uh, the uh, blanks are for in red. I guess I shouldn't use red here. Uh, and Israel is the vine in the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, Psalm 80, 8 to 13, Isaiah uh, uh, 5 and 27, Jeremiah 2 and 12, Ezekiel 15, 17, 19, Hosea. Yeah, this is a pretty uh, uh, pervasive uh, image, both in Psalms and in the prophets, isn't it? Now, uh, why would Jesus then say, I am the true vine, and uh, assuming that uh, his uh, wonderful uh, Galilean Jewish folks w would know that Israel is the vine, since that's one of the you know, powerful images of Israel in the Old Testament, isn't it? Why would he uh, underscore that he's the true vine at this point? All right. But also involving them as disciples and being part of the branches. Of All right. All right. So Jesus is, in a sense, and this is an ongoing emphasis in John's Gospel, he is fulfilling and superseding uh, the role of Israel, isn't he? And in this case, as uh, the, uh, the means of fruitfulness in the world, given that Israel as the vine, it didn't work out so well. She was not fruitful, was she? Okay. Uh, 
what uh, are all the religious leaders of Israel almost uh, uh, as one voice, what are they going to say about Jesus starting uh, later on in this evening and uh, going all throughout the night and uh, into the next day until he's dead uh, later on in the afternoon? What are they going to say with one voice about him? Pardon? He's not, yeah, he's not the true vine. He's not the Messiah. And we're going to hang him on a tree. What, who do you hang on a tree? A criminal. Criminals. And um, according to the Mosaic law, accursed persons. Accursed persons. You hang them on a tree. It's not that just that they die, but you're going to uh, uh, put their body in a shameful state hanging on a tree, on a chunk of wood. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to make Jesus' death uh, not only unspeakably excruciating and painful, but astonishingly shaming to him beyond uh, comprehension so that nobody would follow such a shameful person. And of course then, in the process, what are they going to be saying to both the disciples and everybody else? Hey, you better stay attached to us, to Israel, because <laughs> we're the vine. <laughs> and Jesus' disciples are going to feel that pull, aren't they? Everybody who's anybody in Israel, you know, the, the, the high priest, the chief priest, the elders, you know, the Sanhedrin, uh, a few couple of exceptions like Nicodemus, but almost with one voice, they're going to say, this is an accursed person. Stay away from him. Stay attached to us. And so Jesus says in preparation for them, I am the true vine. You need to be attached and stay attached to me if you want to be fruitful. Wow, that's powerful, isn't it? Now, um, this is uh, not the last I am statement, is it? Uh, it's the seventh one. And then uh, uh, the little blank spaces are the, I don't know what's going on with this, uh, this thing, but those are the, all the I am's. This is the seventh, uh, perhaps maybe the climactic I am, isn't it? And all of these are, in a sense, uh, showing that he's the fulfillment of, and in some sense, Therefore, the, the replacement of uh, Israel and her role for now, that he is taking these things on himself. And this is the, the seventh and the f climactic one, the final one in, in John's Gospel. Now, uh, by the way then, uh, uh, if, if you're attached to Israel, then you're not attached to the true vine, you're just part of that. Uh, and that if you're attached to the true vine, then uh, that's your only hope to bear fruit for God, isn't it? Okay, so it's kind of like you're attached to the true vine, you bear fruit, or you're attached to Israel or anybody else, and you don't bear fruit. Okay, um, how do we read this passage about abiding? How do we understand abiding? Is it uh, kind of an all or nothing thing, like Jesus says? Is that the way we understand it? No, it's really not, is it? That's not the way we talk about it, isn't it? It's, well, you know, today I'm having a good day. I'm abiding today. Yesterday was a bad day. I wasn't abiding. So abiding's kind of, you kind of slide in and out of it, don't you? Eh, today I'm abiding. I'm abiding in Christ. But no, yesterday, tomorrow, I hope I'm abiding tomorrow. You see, it's kind of a, a toggle. It's a kind of our unusual view of the spiritual life, back and forth, back and forth. Um, there's some difficulties with that because if you aren't abiding enough to where you bear fruit, what's going to happen? You're going to get cut off. Christians? So then you can see we're getting into some unusual theology, aren't we? Lose your salvation sort of theology. Is that what this passage is about? No. Who are the, who are the folks that are uh, close to the vine, uh, supposedly attached to the vine, that uh, are, uh, are, are there but don't bear fruit, who are those folks that get cut off? Well, it could be all of Israel. Uh, it could be uh, all those. The ultimate test is if you are, are attached is you will bear fruit. If you don't, that's a really bad statement about the vine, isn't it? <laughs> the vine didn't work for you. 
So it's not the vine's problem, it's your problem, isn't it? In terms of the, you're not attached to it. So I don't think this is about losing your salvation. And I don't think this is about toggling in and out of fellowship with Christ. This is about being attached to Him through initial faith and, and how that then continues through a life of, as His disciple of faithfulness. And the evidence of that is that you bear fruit. Now, you may not like that. It's kind of a, you know, you can tell a tree by its fruit, right? So I, I think we got to put it in its historical setting. It's a wonderfully beautiful, comforting thing. And we ought to be comforted that we believed in Christ and we we're attached to the true vine, and now we can bear fruit for God. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It doesn't seem yeah. to me like he's totally trying to comfort them with this analogy. Like oh, it's an exhortation, isn't it? Allegory. Yeah. I mean, he says, I'm the true vine. I mean, it's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, the, the challenge is like remain in me because if you end up not remaining in me, you're yeah. going to be burned. That's right. You'll be, yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. That's a challenge. But he also ends it right after a few verses where he says, hey, I'm doing this to yeah. out of love and that your joy may be full. Yeah. Okay. It, it's just that all these things go together, aren't they? Uh, we tend to emphasize initial faith and then kind of that's the end of it. But no, it's, it's uh, notice the whole abiding thing is you, you are attached and uh, it's, a, it's a whole identity. It's a whole way of life, isn't it? Of, of, of being attached and staying attached. Okay. Well, uh, I have a, a little thing from D.A. Carson and his John commentary on John 15 too, this rather troubling verse about cutting these branches off and throwing them away, or burning them. Um, so if you'd like to pick that up, you can get that on the way out. But uh, again, I think it's my exhortation to you is be aware of your glasses. Let's be aware of our glasses because uh, they cause us not to see certain things and maybe to overly single out other things. And so we'll never have, per we'll never be perfectly glasses free, will we? It's a part of being a human being. It's part of the humility of it, isn't it? We all have a culture. We have a gender. We have a personality. We have emotions, all those things. But as healthily self-conscious interpreters, let's do the best we can to be aware of those things. And uh, God will use that and bless that. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.